How to Be an Anti-Racist offers a refreshing approach that will radically reorient America on the urgent issues of race, justice, and equality. Ibram X. Kendi's concept of anti-racism re-energizes and reshapes the conversation about racial justice in America, but even more fundamentally points us towards liberating new ways of thinking about ourselves and each other. In his memoir, Kendi weaves together an electrifying combination of ethics, history, law, and science, including the story of his own awakening to anti-racism bringing it all together in a cogent, accessible form. He begins by helping us rethink our most deeply held, if implicit, beliefs and our most intimate personal relationships, including beliefs about race, IQ, and interracial social relations, and re-examines the policies and larger social arrangements we support. How to Be an Anti-Racist promises to become an essential book for anyone who wants to go beyond an awareness of racism to the next step of contributing to the formation of a truly just and equitable society. Ibram X. Kendi is a New York Times best-selling author and the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at American University. A professor of history and international relations and a frequent public speaker, Kendi has a column at The Atlantic and he is the author of Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, which won the National Book Award for Nonfiction, and the Black Campus Movement, which won the W.E.B. Dubois Book Prize. Kendi lives in Washington, D.C. Molly Crabapple, an artist and writer in New York, has drawn in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Dhabi's migrant labor camps and with rebels in Syria, and received widespread praise for her illustrated memoir, Drawing Blood. Crabapple is a contributing editor for Vice and has written for the New York Times, the Paris Review, and Vanity Fair. Her work is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ibram X. Kendi and Molly Crabapple. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, and I'm so honored to be here uh, speaking with Dr. Kendi about his extraordinary new book. I first fell in love with your work uh, when I read Stamped from the Beginning, which, for those who haven't read it, is a history of racist ideas from Aristotle to the present that especially focuses on the pseudoscience, pseudoethics, and pseudotheology that underpinned American slavery and American racism. It's this incredibly rigorous, thought-provoking book that I always compare it to a brick made of knowledge, except unlike a brick, you use it to smash through walls and not to build them. But this book is different, because if stamped from the beginning was a brick, this is a scalpel. It is a sleek and beautiful weapon to excise a cancer that's eating our country. We live in a time when white supremacy is bellowed from the loudest megaphones enacted by the most powerful political and corporate offices, when it is explicit and it is growing and it is violent. And to fight racism, we need more than tolerance, which is a word that has always brought to mind an uncomfortable pair of high heels that you tolerate. We need anti-racism. So this is the book about that. Dr. Kendi, one of the very provocative ideas that you have in your book is that racist, it's not a fixed state, right? You write, no one becomes a racist or an anti-racist. We can only strive to be one or another. Can you describe what that means? Sure. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank you, Molly, for moderating this. Of course, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming out. This evening, I'd like to thank Judson as well as McNally Jackson for, for organizing this. And, and yeah, I, I think that one of the greatest misnomers about the term racist is that it is a sort of fixed identity, 
It is who a person is. It is in a, it's in a person's bones, because we have people saying, I don't have a racist bone in my body. We have both Democrats and Republicans saying that. Um, that it's in the person's heart. It's essential to a person. And what is essential to the person is not just that they're racist, but that they're evil. They're a bad person. A racist is a bad person. A racist is a white supremacist who's a bad person. And with that type of framing, it makes sense that so many people, no matter what they say, will say what? I am not racist. I am not that, right? I am a good person. And we also believe, and we've been led to believe, that racist is almost like a slur. That it's, the, it's a quote R word. I've started to use the R word because people treat it as if it's an R word like an N word, right? That, that it is a pejorative term, that you're attacking me. Um, people think it's a pejorative term not realizing that Richard Spencer also has said it is a pejorative term. Richard Spencer, who, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, he coined the term the alt-right. He was the person who two years ago helped organize the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia that led to, of course, violent clashes in Heather Heyer's death. He once wrote that racist isn't a descriptive term, it's a pejorative term. White supremacists have been saying for decades to specifically white people that when you're called racist, they are essentially attacking you. They're, they're saying a slur to you. And I don't even think that many people realized how much they had taken in that white nationalist's form of rhetoric. So racist is a descriptive term. It just describes whether a person is saying a racist, when a person is saying a racist idea, it describes when a person is supporting a policy that is racist. And people change. So in one moment, they can be saying something that's racist. In other words, saying this is what's wrong with a racial group. And in the next moment, they can be speaking about the equality of racial groups, which is why we have to describe a person based on what they're doing and saying in the moment in terms of whether they're being racist or even anti-racist. And this brings me to my next question. I've always been slightly allergic to calling writers brave because I'm a writer and I know what being a writer is. It's you sit in a room and you, you know, type things and that's not very brave. However, this is a very brave book because it would be easy in some ways to write a book about other people's racism or other people's racist actions. But this is a book where you are absolutely brutal on your own racist actions. You excavate yourself and you're extraordinarily self-critical even as you're very, very generous to other people. Can you talk about your choice to make that the focus of the book? I think that really started um, and I, I really was able to grasp the importance of, of doing that probably in, in January of last year uh, when I was in and out of, of doctor's offices and I was writing this piece for the New York, Time that New York Times that was ultimately titled The Heartbeat of Racism is Denial. And at the time, I had been diagnosed with cancer with, with stage four colon cancer. And I was wrestling with accepting and acknowledging the fact that I had cancer at, at my age with no risk factors. And, and I knew intuitively that in order for me to fight this fight, right, in order to me, for me to survive, that I had to stop denying basically that I had cancer. And, and ultimately, I feel like that was in a way writing that piece, right? You know, from the, from the same standpoint that in order for America to survive, America has to basically stop denying that it has metastatic racism. And if the heartbeat of racism is denial, then I came to see in that moment that the heartbeat of anti-racism is confession is acknowledging and recognizing 
and literally confessing the ways in which we have been, the way in which we are being racist, the way the racist ideas that, that we have consumed over the course of our lifetime, the racist power structure that we have supported, the racist policies that we didn't know were necessarily racist policies, but we supported them anyway. And, and I realized that that was essential to engaging on this journey to be anti-racist. And so I realized, first and foremost, that if I was going to write a book about how to be an anti-racist, I essentially, it had to be a confessional. And it had to be a self-critical confession. I wasn't just going to confess, I was also going to fundamentally criticize my ideas, particularly my anti-black ideas, um, because I felt like I had to sort of model that um, for everyone else. One of the things that uh, was particularly powerful to me, because I, I'm, my father is Latino, but I, I look pretty white, and you know that's kind of shaped how my life has been, is that race is something that uh, doesn't exist in a scientific sense, and yet your perceived race is something that determines so much about your life. You have a really, really, really beautiful line. For all of that life-shaping power, race is a mirage, which doesn't lessen its force. We are what we see ourselves as, whether what we see exists or not. We are what people see us as, whether we see it or not. So tell me more about race as something that both doesn't exist scientifically and yet shapes so much and has to be acknowledged. So first and foremost, I think most Americans uh, are aware of the fact that scientists have essentially been able to recognize that there really is no such thing as a genetic race. <laughs> that essentially the racial groups as currently constructed are pretty much 99% genetically the same. And in fact, scientists, and I should say geneticists, have found that people in Western Africa are more genetically similar to people in Western Europe than they are to people in East Africa or Southern Africa. Because the most genetic diversity in humanity actually resides within Africa, between Africans, rather than between Africans. And so this idea that there is this sort of biological race that exists has been scientifically disproven. Um, and, and so really, race is a construction. And I talk about it as being a power construct uh, in, in this text. And, and so it's not real. But then again, it is definitely real, right? And, and it's real right now. There is someone who looks like me who's walking down a street right now and, and people are clutching their purses because he looks like me. There's somebody who looks like me and a cop is suspecting him because he looks like me. There's someone, and you know, I can go on and on, right? And, and so it's very real, right? And, 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 and because of our conceptions, because we've been trained to see race, and because that those racial constructions, and more I should say racist policies, have led to racial inequities, it is critical that we recognize race. And, you know, we have, ever since geneticists have found we're pretty much the same, what some people have tried to say is, you know what, let's just stop categorizing by race. There's only one race, the human race. Anybody heard that? Right? And it sounds progressive, right? But what happens is if we do not recognize the races, meaning if we don't categorize by race, meaning if we don't take racial statistics, then we're not going to be able to identify racial inequities. Because you need racial data in order to identify racial inequities. And then if you can't identify racial inequities, how can you identify racist policies that are causing those inequities? And if you can't identify racist policies, then how are you going to challenge, let alone remove those policies? So essentially, if we truly were colorblind and just saying there's one race, the human race, in the midst of all of these racial inequities, we would essentially be doing nothing to challenge racism. At the same time, we would have been misled to believe that racism doesn't exist, even though it's fundamentally harming people every day. Your book goes a lot into policy, 
And one of the things that you say is that there is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. There are either racist or anti-racist policies. Can you speak a bit more about what that means and what that looks like in practice? Sure. So I think fundamentally the, books, the book <laughs> uh, sort of hangs on this contrast between racist and anti-racist. And, and I make the case that there's no such thing as a not racist person, there's no such thing as a not racist idea, and there's no such thing as a not racist or race neutral policy. And the quote, not racist, what we have been led to believe is that specifically by those who've been charged with being racist, is that the, what we say in response is, oh, I'm not racist, as opposed to what? Maybe what I said was indeed racist. Maybe what I did was indeed racist. So people are fundamentally defensive, and so they constantly say, I'm not racist. And what they don't realize is white supremacists are saying, I'm not racist. Even presidents are saying, I'm the least racist person anywhere in the world. Eugenicists were saying in the 1940s, I'm not racist, this is science. Jim Crow segregationists were saying, we're not racist, it is separate but equal, and black people are happy. This is what has long been the defense against those being charged with being racist. I'm not racist. And really, that is the only meaning it has ever had, it has ever projected. When being charged with being racist, the response is, I'm not racist. When an anti-racist would say, well, maybe what I said was racist. Maybe what I did was racist. And, and then it comes to policies, right? We don't realize that the term race-neutral policy was actually created by racists. <laughs> Some of us are old enough, I'm not one of them, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to remember that the original opposition to affirmative action policies, and I'm talking back in the early 1970s, were saying that, oh, those are race conscious policies, and let's say standardized tests are race neutral. Anybody remember that? Because they still say that today. The, the, the opposition to affirmative action policies, which were reducing racial inequities, were saying, you know what, those are race conscious, and then they created this idea that standardized tests are, what, race neutral. Now, we, I talk a bit about standardized tests in, in this text, but let's just say there's no such thing as a race neutral policy. And you know why? Because every single policy, whether it has racial language or not, either creates racial equity or inequity, period. And, and policies that create racial equity, policies that reduce racial inequity, are anti-racist. Policies that reproduce racial inequity, create racial inequity, are racist. It's just that simple. And so how can a policy, there's no neutrality, there's no in-between policies that create racial equity and policies that create equity. Those who also created the idea that we determine a policy as racist by intent we're racist too. <laughs> I don't think Americans realize how much the language that they use to describe America's racialized word were created by racists themselves because it allowed their own racism essentially to be exonerated. And that's a, that, that term race neutral, even race blind that the New York Times recently used, these are terms created by racists. You have a really beautiful uh, critique of uh, uplift suasion, the idea that if black people just act good enough and are impressive enough, white people will stop being racist to them. And you describe racism as not coming from you know, people's bad feelings or their ignorance, but from the actual material interests that um, racists benefit in a material, concrete, and uh, solid way uh, from the racism. And you trace that even back to you know, Henry the Navigator and uh, the creation of chattel slavery. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, when I, of course, wrote Stamp from the Beginning, 
um, and even sort of furthering this idea in, in this text, I, I wanted people to, to recognize, and I wanted to discover, I should say, for myself, so the reader could recognize really the source of this problem. Because we have been taught the source of this problem is ignorance and hate. And, and I live in Washington, D.C., and, and, and oftentimes when my neighbor, who hopefully won't be my neighbor for long, um, says something like, uh, okay, I probably shouldn't say that in a church. Okay, I probably shouldn't say that in a church. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, when he says, you know, Baltimore is infested, right? Uh, when, when, when he says that Robert E. Lee was an honorable general, right? When he says there were very fine people on both sides, the, the, the response from some Americans is, oh, he's just ignorant. He just didn't know that, that Robert E. Lee was a Confederate general fighting for the maintenance of slavery. He just must not know history. Or he just didn't know that, that, that white supremacists actually have been terrorizing Americans for, for a very long time. He, he just must be ignorant. Or he just must, just, he just must wake up every day and just hate black people. He just, specifically, he, you know, he, he hates black women. He, he just hates black, he hates Latinx people, and that's why he's trying to get them out of this country. He just hates them. That is the source of his racist ideas. Isn't that what we're taught? Isn't that what people say when they respond by saying, oh, he's just hateful and ignorant? They're, they're saying that the source of, of those racist ideas are ignorance, is ignorance and hate. But, but I would argue, no, that's actually not the source. The, the, the source is defending racist policies. The source is actually self-interest. The source is, you know what, how do I maintain political power? How do I gain political power? I gain political power by making America white again. And then, specifically with the white people, manipulating them into believing that I am their savior even as I'm destroying them. So they are, I, my policies are harming them, and I'm convincing them that Latinx people are harming them. And then they end up writing manifestos <laughs> and describing how their, the dream job of the future is no longer going to exist because of Latinx immigrants, as opposed to the people that they worship and outline their names with guns. Everybody know what I'm talking about. And, 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 you know, what I'm talking about ultimately is that I found through my research that when we actually look at the producers of racist ideas, not the consumers, so, so not the people listening to the speech, the people giving the speech, the people spreading these ideas, that these people are producing these ideas to defend existing racist policies that typically benefit them, that the racist policies are leading to racist ideas not the other way around, and people are consuming those racist ideas and becoming ignorant and hateful. And so for people like the president and others like him, like Moscow Mitch, is that what they call him now? Um, they, I can't even, I don't even know whether they believe those ideas. But what I do know is they are using them as a weapon to essentially defend their own self-interest. Speaking of material interests, you refer to racism and capitalism as conjoined twins uh, that were both birthed with the transatlantic slave trade of African people. Can you tell me about anti-capitalism and what it means to you and why that's so tied with anti-racism? So yeah, I mean, it's just precisely as what you said. When, when you look at the history of capitalism, when you look at the history of racism, and you root them, and you date them, <laughs> and you describe their development, and you describe how and when they develop, and you describe their impact, you're essentially describing the same thing. But then again, the same thing with two different sort of personalities and two different faces, which is why I sort of talked about or described racism and capitalism as like the conjoined twins. And and, and so I think that when we look at, for instance, 
American poverty. American poverty, and poverty is going to exist in a capitalist system. But American poverty, poverty has always been racialized. In other words, black people and other groups, not native people and Latinx people, have historically been disproportionately poor. And that, that's not just the case for the United States. That's the case for around the world. As forecasters are estimating, as I talk about in the book, that by 2030, 90% of people living in extreme poverty will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. That is the result of both racism and capitalism. And so you can't really truly be anti-racist if you are pro-capitalist. And you can't truly be somebody who imagines that you can create an anti-racist society without challenging capitalist policies. And, and I know that m many people, particularly popular and powerful people, um, imagine themselves, imagine that we can sort of create an equitable so sort of society, but what they don't realize is that if we, for instance, eliminate, quote, racism, and leave capitalism, you know what's gonna happen? You're still gonna have black elites and the black poor. And black elites are still going to justify their position based on denigrating ideas of the, of the, of the black poor. So the same ideas that black elites have now for the black poor, they would have in that other society. And the construct of white trash will also still exist. <laughs> so that white elites can justify their position relative to the white poor. And so you can't really eliminate, anyway, I think, I think everybody gets the point. <laughs> One thing that really struck me in your book is you have a very sharp critique of what I'm gonna call a feelings-based activism. Uh, you know, super edgy uh, speeches that alienate everyone, uh, demonstrations where you hold a bunch of signs but there's not a clear aim. Stuff that doesn't achieve results. Uh, you say, what if instead of feelings advocacy, we had outcome advocacy that put equitable outcomes before our guilt and anguish? So can you tell me what that sort of effective activism looks like? I think first and foremost, I was very deliberate in this chapter in defining the term activist. Um, because as you know, everybody imagines themselves, uh, not everybody, but a large number of people like to fancy themselves as activists, right? The people, for instance, you know, Molly was a, a, a arrested over the weekend. The people who were tweeting about that <laughs> were imagining themselves as just as much of an activist as Molly, right? And, and so ultimately, what I, what, the way I defined activist is, is somebody who has a record of power or policy change. That's different than an educator, <laughs> right? And, and, and the reason why I was very deliberate in that is because what do, we, what do you even to identify as an activist, what do you need first? You need to bring about change. You need to succeed in your protest, in your campaign, in your power struggle. And I think if we frame it in that way, right, it's not enough to just, you know, I talk about in the, in, in the failure chapter, in the chapter you're referring to, how, you know, people go to, for instance, demonstrations and, and you know, their favorite speakers on stage and, you know, they feel so good and then they go home and, and they're feeling good you know, it's almost like they went to their favorite concert. <laughs> and then they tell their friend, oh yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm an activist. And nothing changed, but except how they felt. <laughs> but in their mind, since apparently they're involved in the struggle to improve their own feelings, they feel as if something happened. <laughs> and, and let me say that I think it is critical Demonstrations, and I distinguish between demonstrations and protests. Demonstrations are, are, are gatherings that discuss and demonstrate that there is a problem. A protest puts direct pressure on power. Everybody understand the difference? 
and I talk a little bit more about it in the book, but, but demonstrations are critical because people need to learn, people need to be inspired, people need to be mobilized, people need to join the campaign or even the organization. But we can't just keep going to rallies and thinking that that is enough and we go home feeling good and then we go to a restaurant and oh, we feel even better and then we go to sleep. And then we feel as if we're activists and we feel as if we're changing something. And then what happens? Nothing changes. And then what do we get? We get cynical. Oh, you know, we're doing all of this and nothing's happening. No, we need to change our tactics. And even when we engage in a protest, and that protest does not succeed, instead of becoming cynical, instead of going home, what should we do? Figure out a new and more, more effective form of protest. Even when we put somebody in a position of power who we think is going to change policies, and then that person does not change policies, instead of saying, okay, you know what, you know, power, what do people say, power corrupts indiscriminately, I forget that. And no, we need to put a, a different person in a position of power and, and continue to put people in positions of power and continue to leverage our power to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing until we succeed. This is a good lead-in to my final question or request. Tell us all about your new project, the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. Sure, so I, I think that I wanted to obviously sort of build a center that was helpful in bringing about sort of policy change, particularly um, as it was along the lines of race. And, and what we found is that policy change has historically happened as a result of four different types of people who typically work in isolation and typically informally work together. Um, and, and that is scholars by literally uncovering the problem. In other words, uncovering the racial inequities, uncovering the racist policies, and, and typically policy experts have been critical in innovating new potential policies. Journalists have been critical in, in, in revealing and broadcasting those policy innovations and the research that they're based on. And activists have been critical in waging campaigns to get those policies instituted. Typically, they work in isolations. You know, activists in grassroots groups, policy experts in think tanks and governments, scholars on university campuses and journalists and media organizations. So we thought, well, what if we bring these four types of people together on the same team to work on the same issue for a year and, and sort of arm them with students uh, that would then allow them to really figure out a, a racial problem that we, we feel is intractable, to really build a campaign to challenge the policies and power that are that is causing those inequities or injustices. So that's one sort of side of the center. We're trying to build these teams of, 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 of scholars, policy experts, journalists, and activists. But then we're also doing these sort of high-level policy convenings in which we're bringing together specialists in a particular field to essentially set the agenda or set policy where it typically doesn't even exist. And then finally, of course, we're, we're figuring out ways to bring together anti-racist voices into conversation before people. And that's one of the reasons why we did the, the National Anti-Racist Book Festival, which we held in Washington this past April, and more than upwards of 3,000 people came out to listen to some of the, some of the most brilliant um, writers who are writing on race of our time. So I think that's a good place to end our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kendi. I want to open it up to questions, however, before I um, take any questions, know this. There will be no comments rather than questions. If I see anyone saying this is not a question but a comment, I will order the mic taken away from you and I am brutal. refer to, I'm trying to make sure I understand this, you refer to activists versus educators and that kind of thing, and you say that if it doesn't change your policy, then it's not necessarily active, activism in that sense of the word. 
how would you describe any of those people? And I happen to be, I'm a little bit self-conscious right now, happen to be one of those people who went to DC. If we went to DC and we were not able to stop Kavanaugh despite trying, is that activism, is that education, or is that protest? How would you describe that? So I'd have to learn a little bit more about the sort of type of campaign you went in, but ultimately what I'm trying to get at by that definition is that ultimately activists have success stories. And, and the reason why that's critical is because there are so many people who believe that they can engage in campaigns that are not successful and are not even striving, and most importantly, to be successful. That's the key that it's just something to do to present yourself as challenging the problem. And, and there's so many people who are doing that, and there's so many people who haven't been successful, and they're not even trying to be successful, but they imagine themselves as activists. And it's a very, very high bar that I've set for activists, that literally you have to have a record of power and policy change. And what happens is activists, I should say people, who are engaged in campaigns and protests, sometimes they succeed and sometimes they don't. I'm not saying that if somebody engaged in a campaign or a protest that there's necessarily something wrong with them. What it is that we fail sometimes. The question is, are we going to keep striving and challenging? That's the question. And, and so I think that what's critical for us, and I, I write about sort of a time in which I failed in the text. And I was blaming everybody, but my tactics. And I think that's what I'm ultimately getting at. Like, we have to constantly be looking in the mirror of our own ideas, of our own tactics, as opposed to constantly blaming something else. Hi. Um, I guess this is a question for, for both of you. Um, so, um, as most people here probably know, um, uh, Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib weren't allowed into Israel. And I've been thinking a lot today, as a Jew who's an anti-Zionist, what is the relationship between anti-racism and anti-Zionism? Is it possible to be anti-racist without being anti-Zionist? And what possibilities does this open up um, for people who are trying to challenge settler colonialism and to think more internationally about anti-racist fights? I'll say very briefly and, and then pass it to Molly. In order to be anti-racist, you literally have to be against every form of bigotry because every form of bigotry literally intersects and reinforces with racism. There's a history of Zionism that was not necessarily racist. And by this I mean like Ahed Ho'am and uh, Zionists who didn't want to create a state. But once you start talking about creating an ethno state, and that is what political Zionism is, it's about creating an ethno state with a Jewish majority, that inevitably involves ethnic cleansing and it inevitably involves racism. And it would involve racism if it was Serbia for the Serbians or if it was Poland for the Poles and it involves racism when it's that Israel is a state for Jews and Jews alone. And I think that one of the things that's becoming increasingly apparent is that as Israel becomes ever more right-wing and as this becomes ever more explicit under the Netanyahu government, there's becoming a real cleavage between uh, the Israeli government and between American Jews, 80% of whom did not vote for Donald Trump and who are overwhelmingly liberal. And I think that the ban, this disgusting ban on Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar entering Israel is only making this further explicit because many, many Arab people, many Palestinian people and many activists have been banned from entering Israel uh, Vince Warren, uh, the amazing director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, was recently banned from entering Israel. Uh, the director of Human Rights Watch in Israel is being threatened with deportation. I have friends who are banned from entering Israel just because they were like, I don't know, 20-year-old Arab girls who wanted to uh, coach soccer. Uh, 
I think that it's part of a pattern, and I think that we cannot have ethnostates in this world. Ethnostates are wrong. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I wanted to know if any of your work focuses or discusses colonialism, which is a big thing in indigenous circles. And I also wondered if you had ideas or suggestions on how the media can cover these issues in a climate where everything, the, the whole infrastructure is racist, and how does one break out of that? So, I mean, I think in, in How to Be an Anti-Racist, I don't necessarily explicitly talk about settler colonialism, um, largely because it's, 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 it's more of a sort of conceptual sort of journey. And, um, but in terms of your second question, the, I think the media um, should do its job. To me, the job of a reporter is to use the dictionary um, to describe reality. And if there's a heat wave in New York, I don't think it's political for them to say it's hot. If somebody says that, you said I can use curse words? Okay. If somebody says, you know, African and Latinx nations are shitholes, I don't think it's political to say that's a racist idea. And the problem is that we have imagined that calling someone a racist is, a, is basically like calling them a slur. Like, basically, media members believe that. And reporters believe that. And, but they have no problem, for instance, calling somebody who just engaged in a criminal act a criminal even though that criminal's not gonna like that he was described or she was described as a criminal in, in the paper, but they have no, they, they don't even think twice about calling that person a criminal when they know that person engaged in a criminal act. But then calling someone a racist, they're like, oh, that person's not gonna like that. They're, they're gonna feel hurt. People like them are gonna feel hurt. So they don't, we don't think of, oh, you know what, you know, people who rob banks are, are just gonna be upset, you know, that we call somebody a bank robber. Right? I mean, but that's how ridiculous it, it truly is. To me, you know, a racist is a, is a term that we can define that journalists can use to describe ideas, policies, and people. And I think they should essentially do that. Thank you for being here. But aside from the beautiful protests that are going on by the folks in Hong Kong right now, what are some protests recently or historically that rise to the level that you're saying we need to get to? power of policy change. Clearly that's power change, right? I mean, there, there, we have so many examples um, in which we've succeeded, right? Just like we've had so many times in which we have not because the forces that we're going up against, I mean, y'all know how powerful these people are. Y'all know they're willing to use any weapon of lies or war to maintain power. Um, and of course, sometimes, if not most times, we're going to fail. But we have succeeded. I'm standing here right now on so many levels because we, we've succeeded. But we're still having this conversation right now because on so many levels we failed. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I have a question uh, in terms of when we're thinking really long-term goals. 
so race is a figment that has real effects. Some of those effects are very dehumanizing, grotesque, uh, violent, and destructive. Some of those effects are very beautiful. If we think, for example, about Toni Morrison uh, and the kind of art that she produced out of her consciousness and her love of uh, black people, black culture, black history. If we're thinking about the long-term goals of the policies that you want to develop, are those that over time we dissolve race because of its destructiveness? Or is it that we get, do race right? That there's something that we can redeem in it because of all the beauty it's also enabled? So I, I think you, not to sell the book any, but I think you'd really appreciate the space chapter because that's really something that, that I try to sort of speak to. But, but the larger sort of question is, I think that once we get to a point in which racist policies don't exist, in which thereby racial inequities don't exist, then that will be up to humanity, right? Be, do we want to continue to categorize by race or not? There is, in fact, I would agree, some positive, I'm, I'm trying to use my words <laughs> uh, carefully, I, I, I think that there are some ways in which continuing to identify race can be affected. Let me give an example. I know from traveling around the black world that the cultures of black people, no matter where I go, in Paris, Senegal, Jamaica, Brooklyn, that I see striking similarities, right? And to me, that's just beautiful, right? To see these striking similarities in, in the cultures of, of black people, right? Racialized, people who are racialized as black. And, and so to me, if we didn't have the conception of blackness, right? I wouldn't even have the conception of seeing those, in a way, those similarities. Um, and, and so I think that ultimately, I'm not answering your question, but I'm trying to answer it by saying that would literally be up to humanity. And it would be a different type of question, right, than the question we're, we're engaged in right now, in which we have racists saying, oh, stop identifying by race, because when you do, you're being racist. I mean, that's, and then we're arguing back. I mean, that's a, it would be a different type of question, uh, conversation. I, I would love to have that type of conversation, as opposed to the conversation we're being forced to have now. There is a belief amongst um, some black people, indigenous people, that we cannot be racist because we've been oppressed by white people. Um, we don't hold the power, so therefore it's difficult to be deemed a racist when you don't have the power. Um, what is your take on that? And secondly, based on the title of your book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, what are your suggestions for how to be an anti-racist? So I think I answered the second question in the book, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but to the first question, I think that we should first recognize the origins of this idea. For instance, black people can't be racist because black people don't have power. That idea largely emerged during the Black Power Movement when black power activists who were largely anti-racist were essentially challenging white racism. And they were being, like we are today, categorized as the real racist. <laughs> and, and then they struck back, how, I mean, how can we be racist? You know, we don't even necessarily have power. And you can't really have, you can't really, really be racist unless you have power. And so that construct has, of course, lived on for 50 years. The problem is that I think that we should recognize the ways in which black people and other people of color have power. First and foremost, every single person on earth has the power to resist. They have the power to resist racism. And some people, because of their racist ideas, do not use it. In other words, they live in a, in a poor black neighborhood, 
and they believe, they have been led to believe that black people should be poor because black people are not working hard, because black people are lazy. And so what? They don't resist the actual policies that are creating their own poverty and the poverty of other black people. And so what racist ideas is doing to them is causing them to not use their most basic element, which is the power to resist. And then you have people who have the ability to carry out policies. In other words, you have black people who are middle managers who have the ability to say, you know what, that policy, that admissions policy is racist. I'm not going to carry that out. And I would rather quit my job and take another job than continue to carry out this policy. And then you have a very limited number of black people who are actually in positions of power to make and break policy. Most notably, Clarence Thomas, who literally, if he was being anti-racist, all of these 5-4 decisions <laughs> would have been another way. He literally has power. And then, you know, other people, I talk in the book about somebody by the name of Ken Blackwell. Ken Blackwell was the Secretary of State of Ohio in 2000. Anybody remember anything that happened in Ohio in 2000, in the presidential election? And the presidential election went to George W. Bush because he won Ohio. And he won Ohio because Ken Blackwell was also his co-campaign chair in Ohio. And Ken Blackwell used his power as Secretary of State. We're now learning how powerful secretaries of states can be to discriminate, I should say, to suppress black votes. And so he had the power to make voting more accessible to all people or to suppress the votes of black people. And he used his power to suppress black votes. Why? Because he wanted to rise up in the Republican Party. Why? Because of self-interest. Right? And so he recognized that he could rise by stepping on other black heads. And there's been so many black people, and you know, the black folk in the room, y'all know what I'm talking about. There's been so many black people who've decided, I'm going to rise up in this society by literally stepping on black people's heads. And we've called them everything. We've called them Uncle Toms. We've called them sellouts. Well, I'm saying we need to start calling them what they've always been, racist. Dr. Kendi, you are an historian who's mobilizing scholars and journalists and activists for this movement. Uh, as we sit in a church that was described as a church that can't exist without uh, being involved in social justice, uh, but perhaps more personally as a preacher's kid yourself, uh, I'm curious if you see any role that churches or communities of faith can play in this anti-racist movement. Sure. So I, yeah, I'm a preacher's kid, and, and my parents pretty much met in what was known as the Black Power Movement, but more specifically for them, the movement um, for black theology. And so they were both Christians who, who imagined that the church was supposed to be an engine of liberation, that Christianity was supposed to be a source of liberation for black people and humanity. They looked at Jesus as black, <laughs> who would have fro, like they had their fro's. Um, and, and what I sort of ultimately realized in, in analyzing the form of Christianity that they were raised in, particularly the, during the black theology movement, and sort of, dis, I should say, contrasting that with the form of Christianity that 80% of white evangelicals have when they voted for Donald Trump, um, I think one of the ways we can distinguish it is one being liberation theology. In other words, Jesus was a revolutionary. <laughs> and the job of the Christian is to revolutionize society. That the job of the Christian is to liberate society from the powers on, on earth that are oppressing humanity. Everybody understand that? So that's liberation theology in a nutshell. Savior theology 
is a different type of theology. The job of the Christian is to go out and save these individuals who are behaviorally deficient. In other words, we're to bring them into the church, these individuals who are doing all of these evil, sinful things, and heal them and save them. <laughs> and then once we've saved them, we've done our jobs. And, and to me, anti-racists fundamentally reject savior theology. That goes right in line with racist ideas and racist theology in which they say, you know what, black people, other racial groups, the reason why they're struggling on earth is because of what they're behaviorally doing wrong. And it is my job as the pastor to sort of save these wayward black people or wayward poor people or, or wayward queer people. That type of theology breeds bigotry. And, and so to me, the type of theology, of liberation theology, breeds a common humanity, a common humanity against the structures of, of power that, that oppress us all. So we have time for one final question. I see a hand waving very enthusiastically there. So that's going to be it. Hi, um, my name is Michael. And I have a question about, so after 2014, many of us who are black, who navigate white spaces, white churches, white institutions, white liberal institutions, white liberal progressive institutions woke up and realized that we were um, trafficking in cultures of white supremacy and have since the Black Lives Matter movement sought to dismantle that. What is the interplay between anti-racist work or the work of an anti-racist and the work of dismantling white supremacy? And what does that feel like for black people navigating white spaces for work or for worship? So, so the, the effects of pro-white racism is essentially white supremacy. That's the effect, right? The reason why I talk about, the reason why I've spoken specifically about racism is because I, I'm, I wanna talk about the engine rather than the effect, right? I wanna talk about what is bringing us to that point in which we have a, a nation that still is, is largely ruled by, by white people, even though this is quite a diverse nation, right? And that is racist policies. And, and so ultimately, by dismantling racism, you're dismantling white supremacy. And even a form of white supremacy that is not just harmful to people of color, it's even harmful to white people. And you know, I think more and more white people are finally beginning to realize <laughs> how white supremacy and how even whiteness itself is killing them. There's actually a new book out called Dying of Whiteness. <laughs> I mean, I don't make this stuff up. Like, you know, literally, <laughs> people are dying of their own whiteness. But more specifically, white supremacist ideas. And to give one quick example, the, you have so many sort of people who worship whiteness in the South who also worship the Confederacy, who also worship Nazis, Nazism. And then when you think about the Confederate States of America launching or initiating a civil war that led to the death of more white people than all other wars combined. And then you think of Nazi Germany that helped initiate a World War II that led to the death of more white people. <laughs> you, see, you, see, you see the pattern here, right? How white supremacy is fundamentally an existential threat to humanity, not, not just people of color. We're, we're, of course, most likely and most likely to be harmed, but, but it literally is posing an existential threat to humanity, and it always has. And, and so fundamentally, anti-racism is life. It literally is, it can save humanity. It can save America from its metastatic cancer. Thank you.